up to see a um, monument to a Nazi war hero, and, and Nazi stormtroopers spotted them and started pelting them with bricks and stones trying to kill them, and they managed to jump in the car and drive away just in time. Joe Jr. was observing the Spanish Civil War, and he was with some of uh, Franco's followers following them around, and they were stopped by communist uh, sympathizers and asked to line up against a wall, and just before they were to be shot, Joe turned around with his American passport, and they let them go. So you can see how involved they were in, in the conflict of the time. Uh, so Jack Kennedy, who had uh, started as a slacker, by the end of 1940, after the war had come on, he had basically done two things. He had written a best-selling book, which called Why England Slept, which warned America how to avoid the predicament that Britain had gotten in by not building up its military preparedness. And he had actually become an advisor to his father. He was actually help. He was now almost the older figure. Joe had been a very outspoken, blunt ambassador in London. And he had alienated a lot of people because he told it as it is. He said he thought the British Empire might go down. He wasn't sure that the British can, could win the war. Lind Charles Lindbergh had convinced him that uh, the, Brit the German Air Force was so far superior to the, to the British and French that Joe believed that, <coughs> excuse me, and he thought that uh, Britain might go down. So uh, his reputation had certainly, certainly gone downhill, although he'd done a lot to help Jewish refugees, more so than any other ambassador, and, uh, uh, which was surprising given Joe Kennedy's reputation for an anti-Semitism. So Jack tried to help his father model himself on Winston Churchill and say that he was the voice from the outside telling the uncomfortable truths that people did not want to hear and he was, that he was an example in courage. And Jack always saw his father as a, as a uh, he, you know, he wrote this book, Profiles in Courage. He didn't include his father in the book, but he might have because he thought his father was a very courageous figure. But, Jack Kennedy learned some lessons from the time in London. 70, 75 years later, there are still very important, uh, sort of, it's a cautionary tale, Joe's ambassadorship. Number one lesson, if you exhibit courage without moral vision, you won't get very far. You have to show a purpose, a meaning beyond just why you're being courageous. And Joe Kennedy, for instance, was very courageous, but he didn't, recognized that the invasion of Czechoslovakia, the invasion of Austria, how devastating that would be, uh, the, the rights of a country were taken over. And so he will always be judged by history negatively for not taking a firmer stand. He believed at the time that you, in, in what we call appeasement. Now at the time, we think of appeasement today as being weak, giving in. But at the time, appeasement was a very realistic, cold politics strategy to try to contain Hitler in order to build up the British military so it was equal to the Nazis and then could take them on. But, but because Joe did not espouse enough moral vision in his statements, uh, he, was, he was decried on both sides of the Atlantic. So Kennedy learned the importance of, of having a moral vision. Secondarily, he learned that people have got to have optimism. A leader has to give hope. And his father often would, would say these blunt and rather pessimistic things. Even Roosevelt, who privately, and Churchill, who were privately pessimistic and very worried that they might not win the war, they never said it publicly, and they were very upset that Kennedy did because it stirred up their worst fears. So it became very important to, uh, look, to express optimism and hope as a part of leadership. Joe, Joe Kennedy is not known for this, but he actually had extraordinary standards of excellence, which he, he worked nonstop in his job as ambassador. I and mean, if you ever get a chance to read my book, the, the amount of work he did, working day and night to try to help Jewish refugees, to try to help Americans spread, it's, it's phenomenal what he did. And he passed on this standard of excellence, which Jack Kennedy then passed on to the nation when he became president. Some of the other legacies from Jack Kennedy, and I will refer more to them because I'm going to talk about the qualities that make a president great, is a capacity for empathy. As someone who came from a family where he'd been an outsider, 
and this is a way, in a way like Barack Obama. Uh, he, has a, he had a, set, a feeling for those who were not in the center of society and conveyed that. Also, he, Rose Kennedy always said to the children, to whom much is given, much is asked. And she passed on the ethic of service. And I noticed that both Barack Obama and McCain in their campaign platforms talk about American service. And many people think, in a way, that President Bush lost an opportunity to call upon the people right after, the American people right after 9-11 for more service to the country. And that, that with the current economic crisis and the world crisis and the terrible threat from Islamic extremists who do, are committed to violence, that, that service and sacrifice is something that the American people and perhaps the people of the world will have to put more focus on than they have in recent years. And, and finally, John Kennedy is a model of growth in office. And I'll talk a little more about that. I want to say, uh, let's, let's go to the uh, inauguration. And let's hear John Kennedy inspire the world with his, with his most famous statement. isolationism or nationalism and engagement with the world and in, even imperialism. And, and so we keep going back and forth between these extremes. And there is some danger right now. There's a lot of people who feel that we've been far too imperialistic in the world in the last eight years. And there's a certain danger that we will withdraw into ourselves after this election and not become fully engaged with the world. And one of the um, uh, Obama's statements is that the American moment has not passed, but we must make sure not to withdraw inward. We must re-engage with the world to work for our common stability and security. So in terms of the 1960 election that, <clears throat> that won the presidency, the appeasement, the, uh, the fact that Joe Kennedy, the father, was tarred with appeasement, hung over the Kennedy election, over the Kennedy family, over the Kennedy White House, and still to this day, the specter of appeasement is very active in our imagination and in our election. So, for instance, when Jack Kennedy was debating Richard Nixon, uh, Nixon accused him during the first debate of being an appeaser because he didn't feel like we needed to take care of uh, the islands of Kimoy and Matsu and, and hold back China. Uh, and uh, Kennedy called, sort of fought back and said that uh, Nixon was like Baldwin, he was sort of a complacent type. But during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, when Kennedy, base, Kennedy truly had, as we know now, and didn't know then, but we know now how close we came to extinction. <coughs> and Kennedy had the world right there, and, and he made the wise decisions in the end, which averted catastrophe which was so much closer than we ever imagined. Only recent scholarship has shown this. But uh, he, even in that debate, Curtis LeMay, who was one of the top uh, majors there, top military people, he tried to bully Kennedy into making a military strike on Cuba by saying he was just as bad as a, being an appeaser to do the blockade, which he planned to do. And so that was his, but Kennedy didn't fall for that, and he ignored him, and he went ahead and did the blockade, which was the thing that worked. And so going into the presidency, Jack Kennedy was more, as I said, more of a hawk. He was about confronting communism. Part of his vision was stopping communist aggression around the world. That was very important at that time. 
And uh, so that...